Well, you're, yeah, I'll get started with uh, week two again. Welcome to week two. And you're lucky because you have Dr. Smith here, not only as, as one of your uh, coordinators, but also as a presenter this week. So I'll do the, the you know, very short introduction here and then uh, turn it over to, um, to our wonderful presenters. But as, as I mentioned last time, in case there were some of you who didn't make it, um, the way that this works is we, we're going to have four really excellent presentations and we're going to um, then uh, turn it over to some uh, question and answer session with at the end. Um, I, unless the presenters want to do something differently, uh, the way we did it last time was to have all the presenters go and then have the discussion all together at the end. And that way we can model uh, what, what I mentioned last time about what, one of the purposes of this class is to think about interdisciplinarity. And we can really model that if we allow for questions to be answered by, uh, by multiple professors coming from their own um, specific uh, disciplinary backgrounds. Um, so you're certainly welcome to raise any questions to start discussion, um, either you know asking, uh, I'll be here monitoring the chat, so either asking me or reaching you know, out generally to, to your peers and, and raising um, some issues or, or flagging something you'd like to talk about later through the chat. And then we'll, we'll have um, question, an open question and answer period at the end. If you'd like um, to note a question that, um, that you'd like to pose, but you're afraid you'll forget it later, um, you can throw it into the chat and I'll take note of it and we can raise it later, or you can just hold it till the end. Um, each presentation will be uh, you know, somewhere between 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so um, we, we should basically have no more than you know an hour, an hour, hour and 20 minutes um, max, and then we'll have the rest of the time um, reserved for question and answer. So um, don't worry, we'll have plenty of time to start a good discussion. Any questions before we jump in? Uh, have you determined your order who's going first, presenters? I think it's Brittany, me, Tom, and Derek from the flyer. Okay, okay then I'll so hand we, it over and let you if each of you introduce. That, can a, yeah, a brief introduction and uh, of, you know your background, and then we're excited to see to hear your presentations. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Tyrell. So I'm going to um, pull up my presentation then. Um, so hello, everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Dr. Brittany Asaro, and I am a professor of Italian studies. So you, at USD, I teach all levels of Italian language. I teach Italian literature and history. Um, sometimes I teach in Italy. Uh, so you can scope out those opportunities um, once you kind of get going. Um, and my research specialty is medieval and Renaissance literature. So I look at texts written in Italy between the 1300s and the 1500s. So I'm going to pause and say that I realize uh, I may have already lost some of you um, who are thinking that what I have to say may have nothing to do with your fields of interest or your potential majors and may have nothing to do uh, with our topic for today, which is how you as students can uh, build and restore communities. But what I hope to show you in the next 15 or 20 minutes is how this poem, Inferno, which was written 700 years ago by a man named Dante, well, it's not an instruction manual for solving our 21st century problems, but Dante's reflections on civic discord in 14th century Florence can help us to meditate upon similar issues in our own context in a meaningful way. So I'll start by saying that we in the Zoom room are not the first to connect Dante's vision of hell to contemporary civic issues. Take, for example, this quote, I am here because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. This is taken from a 1967 speech by Martin Luther King Jr. against the Vietnam War. Here's a similar quote. This one is taken from a press conference by Governor Gavin Newsom given in response to the murder of George Floyd in 2020 calling for action against anti-Black anti -black racism. And the references to Dante are not limited to the speeches of public figures, as you can see in this Twitter post speaking out against racism and in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. So the thing is, this idea that the neutrals are in the hottest place in hell 
Dante never said it. Let me just get my slide going here. Here's what Professor Guy Rafa says, a Dante specialist at the University of Texas. This might be the place for me to stop, tear out my hair or what's left of it and object, Dante never said those words. They imply that neutrality is the worst sin for Dante, but treachery is, and the punishment for that sin isn't fire, but ice. Now as a Dante scholar myself, I get the frustration, but after a gratifying eye roll, what is my next move? What is our next move? And I'm going to suggest that with the time left together today, we get to work. So let's investigate what Dante actually said about neutrality and let's read and find out who is in the so-called hottest place in hell. So first, some very brief background on Dante and his poem. Dante is born in 1265 in the city of Florence, Italy, although the country of Italy did not exist at the time. In his early 20s, not too far from your age now, Dante is already a well-regarded writer, but his day job is politics, working as a diplomat for the city. Florence at this time is a more or less autonomous city-state and it has some serious social political issues. It's dominated by two political factions that are constantly at war with one another. Every time one party wins, it banishes or kills the leaders of the opposing party, and it overturns all the laws that they've made. As a result, if you are Florentine at this time, it meant that violence and fear due to an unstable government is a part of your life. So sure enough, in 1301, when Dante is in his mid-30s, he's on a diplomatic mission in Rome when his party is ousted by their rivals. He receives word that he cannot come back home ever. And if he shows his face within the city walls again, he'll be killed. He finally makes it to Ravenna on the east coast of Italy where he's taken in by a wealthy man who is a fan of Dante's writing. And so now Dante, unemployed and exiled, has to figure out what to do with himself and what to do with these intense feelings towards Florence, at once bitter rage towards its citizens and also heart and breaking nostalgia for his hometown that he'll never see again. So Dante decides to write, but he doesn't write a political treatise. He's going to do that later. <clears throat> Exile has allowed him to look back on Florence as an outsider and it's given him some perspective. You could say it's given him a bird's eye view on life. So he writes something big. He calls it La Comedia, and we now know it as the Divine Comedy. It's an epic like the Odyssey or Star Wars. It's the story of a traveler, Dante himself, who finding himself at a point of crisis in life, journeys through hell, purgatory, and finally to heaven, seeking the answers to his questions and seeking a way that has been lost. Sorry, guys. There we go. The first part of the poem, Inferno, Hell, is the most famous and many would argue the most fun. Dante uh, believes that hell is a funnel in the earth, divided into, into various circles in which a particular sin is punished. The lightest sins are on top, with the sins getting progressively worse as you make your way down to the bottom. So if we think back to the quotes that we looked at at the beginning of this talk, when we're talking about the worst sin, we aren't really talking about the hottest place in hell, but the bottom of hell. Another interesting detail about Inferno, Dante's invention, is the, not the notion of contrapasso. And there's no easy translation, but it can best be explained as the punishment fits the crime. That is the punishment in each of the levels somehow reflects the sin that is being punished. A more accurate way to explain it, though, is that in hell, the eternal, internal struggles of the soul manifest in physical ways that are visible to all. And we're going to see a good example of this in a moment. It's logical, then, in this system that whatever is at the bottom of hell is what Dante sees as the worst thing that the human soul is capable of. It's going to tell us a lot about his worldview. But before we race down there, let's make a pit stop at the neutral souls that have gotten shout outs from MLK, Newsom, and the rest. Interestingly enough, the neutrals are not in hell. Dante thinks so lowly of neutrality that he doesn't even think they deserve to be in hell. Yes, it's a paradox, welcome to Dante. He places them in the vestibule of Inferno 
or as I like to call it, Hal's Lobby. And if we're looking at our imaginative infographic here, I'm guessing that the neutrals are these two people drinking their beverage of choice on a bench in the subway station. The neutrals that Dante encounters in the comedy are heard before they are seen. As the pilgrim's eyes adjust to the darkness of hell, he hears in Dante's words, diverse lingue, orribili favelle, parole di dolore, accenti di ira, voce alte fioche, discordant tongues, harsh accents of horror, tormented words, the twang of range, stri rage, strident voices. It's the sound of people who, although they're occupying the same space, sharing the same fate, they are all still acting frantically for themselves. It's the soundtrack of neutrality, and it isn't pretty. Remember what I told you about contrapasso, the punishment fits the crime? Can you see how this noise, unproductive and ugly, represents the meaningless language of those that refuse to take sides? Dante is almost certainly thinking of those involved in his own exile when he writes these words. Sure, the members of the political party that banished him are deep in hell. But here Dante is utterly disgusted by those who, though they may have not casted a vote against him, didn't stand up for him either. In Dante's poem, he gives the neutrals the ultimate diss. Their cowardice is so loathsome that they don't even earn any words. Let us not speak of them, he says. Look, then pass on. And that's what we're going to do. So let's fast forward to the final circle of hell. Here we come face to face with the worst that humanity can offer. It is a lake of ice, and in it are frozen sinners punished for treachery. Dante comes upon two that, unlike the rest, occupy a single hole together in the ice. And one is eating the head of the other. The sinner lifts his head from his meal, pasto, that's what Dante calls it, and wipes the blood from his mouth upon the hair of his victim. I was Count Ugolino, he says, and then indicating the half-eaten skull, this is the Archbishop Ruggeri. Count Ugolino tells a tale based upon true events that took place in Pisa during Dante's lifetime and was so horrific that news of it spread quickly to neighboring cities, including Florence. Ugolino was a government official in Pisa. He is in hell for political treachery because he betrayed his city by giving away some of their fortresses to their enemies. Ruggeri, the guy whose head Ugolino is eating, was Ugolino's ally. However, after Ugolino helps Ruggeri secure political power, Ruggeri betrays him. Ruggeri imprisons Ugolino and his young sons using this tower as a jail. Oddly enough, today, this is the University of Pisa's library. One morning to his horror, Ugolino hears below the locking of the large tower door below and realizes that he and his sons have been condemned to die of starvation. His sons, too innocent to understand, see the look of terror on their father's face. And the youngest says, what is it, father? But Ugolino says nothing. He does not comfort his sons. He does not weep. Instead, he says, I turned to stone within. A few days pass, all without food or water. Ugolino says that he perceived his own appearance on the faces of his four sons. Now, this is the first of many double meanings in the story. He's saying that his four sons literally look like him. That is, he's talking about genetic resemblance, reminding us of his role as father. At the same time, he's likely talking about the first signs of starvation and dehydration that can now be seen on all of their faces. I bit my hands for rage, he says. Then his kids, thinking that he does so because he's hungry, say, Father, it will be much less pain for us if you eat us. You clothed us with this wretched flesh, and you can take it away. So again, multiple meanings. Ugolino literally gave his sons their flesh. They're his biological children. The flesh could also be read as their situation. It's Ugolino's political wrongdoings for which they're imprisoned. His sons are innocent. Either way, the son's offering that his dad kill him and eat him is pretty disturbing. But even more heartbreaking is Ugolino's reaction. Once again, he says nothing. I quieted myself then, he says, so as not to make them sadder. And that day and the next, we were all mute. On the fourth day without food and water, one of his sons throws himself at his dad's feet saying, 
my father, why do you not help me? And dies on the spot. Over the next couple of days, the other three boys die. For two more days after Ugolino goes blind from starvation, he feels around the room and calls for them, even though by now they've all passed away. So at this point, there's the most famous and troubling line in the episode. Poscia più che dolor, pote il diduno. Then hunger overcame my grief. So there are two meanings here, and I'm wondering if you've already seen one or both. One possibility is that starvation finally shut down Ugolino's organs. And so the lack of food was more powerful than the grief for his sons because he died. The other much more disturbing possibility is the one that's often depicted by artists. Ugolino's hunger overcame his grief. He ate his children. Now remember what I told you about Contrapasso and remember what Ugolino is doing in hell. He's eating someone's head. He's practicing cannibalism. Dante certainly wants us to consider the possibility that Ugolino ate his kids, but he purposely does not give us a clear answer. If we think about it, Dante seems to be saying that either way, Ugolino practiced cannibalism. Stay with me for just a moment. After his young kids repeatedly recognize Ugolino's pain and check in on him, what they are offering him is the comfort of facing pain together as a family, in a word, community. It's an offer that Ugolino repeatedly rejects by turning inward, choosing to focus his energies not on comforting his sons, but on his rage towards his enemy, Ruggeri. He misses the chance to reconcile with his kids, to comfort them as a parent should, even to accept their forgiveness. Instead, like we saw, he turns to stone inside. The Dante scholar John Frechero writes that in the episode of Ugolino, the alternatives are narrowed down to two in a man's relationship. And I would amend this to say human's relationship with their fellow humans, communion or cannibalism. We see this in the parent-child relationship in Ugolino's tale. And because of the political nature of his story, we can certainly extend this to the relationship between citizens. Remember the ugly voices of the neutrals up in Hell's lobby. They are all screaming over each other. Down here at the bottom of Hell, the problem is the same. It's just magnified. When we refuse to build community with one another, when we live only for ourselves, we are essentially devouring one another. This is what treachery looks like for Dante, the worst thing that we as humans are capable of. Now for Dante, this is not the end of the story. Ugolino is in hell because he has lost hope. He's stuck in a mindset, just like he's stuck in ice. But Dante is going to continue out of hell. He's going to make it to heaven, which no surprise is basically a city where all of its inhabitants are in perfect communion with one another. Now, this may not seem so radical at first, since Dante is a Christian author, but remember what we know about him. This is a man whose life experience has taught him to lose faith, faith in the possibility of civic harmony. He is deeply troubled by the infighting between people who are supposed to stand up for each other's rights. And yet time and time again, he sees citizens turning against one another, blaming one another, killing one another. And yet he chooses to keep writing after he finishes in Ferno. He will write down a vision of heaven where our communion with God is inseparable from our communion with each other. But let's float down to earth as Dante does at the end of the Divine Comedy. I want to leave you today with something more practical. So let's talk about you. Now you all know a little bit about Dante, maybe even a little more than the governor of California. So what are you going to do with this information? Let's return for a moment to Dr. Rafa, who we saw tearing out his hair at the beginning of this talk. Uh, at the misquoters of Dante, right? He says, whatever fault lies in attributing those exact words to Dante, it pales in comparison with how well they capture the poet's feelings about the many, many sorry souls who by refusing to act in times of trouble deserve not this condemnation, but total disregard. I agree with Rafa. There's an undeniable power in Dr. King's words. There's a subtle beauty that in a 21st century Twitter post, while calling for justice for all people, 
finds relevance in a 700 year poem. This power, this beauty would be missed if one chooses to use their knowledge of the text to scoff at a misquote. And so I'm gonna end my slideshow for just a minute uh, as I offer you a last thought. All of you who are going to go to an excellent university, you will wield a powerful tool. It's your education. And I urge you, as I think Dante would, to use this tool carefully. Education is privilege, and it can build up as well as break down. So as you progress in your studies, and as you continue on with your lives after USD, I challenge you to resist using education to assert a superiority over others. Dante has shown us the ugliness of being locked in a tower, and I imagine he would have felt the same about ivory towers if the expression had existed at the time. Instead, reject cannibalism. Use your education and the perspective that it offers to build community, to think more carefully and more deeply, and to interact more compassionately and justly with our fellow earthly citizens. So that's all I have for you for now. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, I'm just gonna... Okay, cool. Um, okay, so the title of my talk has changed a little bit. Um, the new title is Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, Evolving Concepts of National Identity in France. And my name is Dr. Eliza Smith. Um, I teach in the same department as Dr. Asaro, Language and Literatures, but my specialty is 19th century uh, French literature. Um, and I teach all levels of French, all kinds of classes. Um, so yeah, hopefully I'll see some of you in my classes in the future. So to start off, oops. Um, I just want to go over some really general objectives for today. Uh, the first one is the expansion of our sociocultural perspectives. The second one is development of comparative analysis and critical thinking. The third learning objective is affecting social change moving forward. And finally, the recognition of the importance of cultural melding rather than separation. And again, these are very general and we're going to get more into specifics um, as the presentation goes on. Okay, so before we sort of delve into uh, the details of this, I want you all to do a silent mental exercise. So I want you to think of what defines you as a person. So what factors make up your identity? So maybe take a few seconds to think of the top five factors. So is it your hometown? Is it the language you speak, the clothes you wear, the music you listen to, the sports you play, et cetera? Um, so yeah, so take a few seconds now, think of, three to five, your top ones. Okay, so once you have those in your mind, I wanna now ask you if your national identity factors into this list. So whatever national identity you have, did it make the cut, okay? Your top um, factors for what you think makes up your own personal identity. So when we think about national identity, it's very closely linked to this idea of nationalism. And I just took the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, but basically national identity is a product of nationalism and national identity can include certain factors and exclude others. And I put this poster from Rocky IV, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, you guys might be way too young for this, but as you can see, you know, he's like, draped in the American flag and he just defeated the Russian opponent. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, propaganda wrapped up in that image. So before we delve into France in particular, uh, just a few general questions about national identity. So the first question I have for you, do you think it's invented, okay? And if it is invented, who invents this identity? Where does this come from? Um, another question I have for you is, which identities matter in this concept of national identity, okay? So it might include some, but exclude others or certain factors, but exclude others. My third question is what problems might it cause? So if we think, for example, of Nazi Germany, okay? So what did a German look like in Nazi Germany? Um, 
blonde, blue-eyed uh, Christian. We have the mass extermination of Jews and other minorities of resistance fighters, all of these things. Um, so that's just, that's an extreme example, but that's one example. So genocide could be a problem. And then finally, how might national identity affect the sense of belonging of a person within a society? So we're gonna get into um, just a, a little case study with France. And so my first question for you is when you hear the term France or French, what images come to mind? So here I have the Eiffel Tower, but maybe you think of baguettes or people on bicycles wearing berets or people smoking in cafes or Emily in Paris. So there's all kinds of stereotypical cliched images that come to mind when you hear France or French. And so, we are actually going to go back in time. We're going to start with the American Revolution of 1777. Um, so this was our separation from the British and our establishment of a democracy here. And the French played a really big role in that. They helped us, um, you know, mobilize with our military and provided financial support. And so almost 10 years later, the French undergo their own revolution. Okay, so partly inspired by what we did in the United States, establishing our own democracy here. So at this time in France, you have a monarchy, you have Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Um, and there are a lot of problems in France at this time. So the king and queen are at Versailles with the royal court. They're totally cut off from the realities of Paris and what's going on with the general populace there. Um, you have large amounts of debts that are plaguing the nation. You also have high taxes because of this debt. Okay, and so again, it's the general public that is taxed, not the aristocrats and um, the monarchy. And then finally, you have widespread agricultural problems. So people are starving to death. There's large amounts of famine. And so after some time, the people get fed up. Okay, they're tired of the monarchy. And, you know, in the American spirit almost, they mobilize themselves. And as you can see, it was incredibly violent. We have this image here of the Bastille prison that they lit on fire. People are up in arms. Um, during this time period too, you have aristocrats who are being hunted down. You have members of the Catholic church, authority figures in the Catholic church who are being hunted down. And it was a really scary, unstable time. But finally, you have the establishment of the first French Republic. And it's really important to know that the French Revolution of 1789 was not the first revolution in France in the 19th century, okay? It was a really unstable time period. You have the Republic, then another monarchy, then an empire, then another Republic, then an empire. And so there's all kinds of political turmoil during this time. But during the first Republic, we have Nap Napoleon, the Napoleon that you all know, Napoleon I, who becomes um, not president, but he's sort of the chief uh, authority figure. And we have the institution of the national motto of France, which is liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, brotherhood, okay? And so France in its, you know, uh, spirit of democracy wanted to sort of, you know, create this atmosphere of freedom. But what we have to remember is that this only applied to certain sectors of the population, okay? And so again, at the same time, we have the Declaration of the Rights of the Man and of the Citizen. And you can actually see this um, tableau, this uh, image in Paris. I was there a few weeks ago and I took this picture. It's quite big in person. It's at the Musée Carnavalet, which is a free museum in the center of Paris, okay? And it's basically the history of France. It's a really cool museum if you're interested in that. Um, but again, like the national motto, this declaration only really pertained to white men, okay? So it didn't pertain to everybody. And so finally, I sort of want to delve deeper into these concepts of national identity and democracy and equality with one final revolution, the Haitian Revolution. And this revolution took place around the same time as the French Revolution, but it's one that historically has not been included in the narrative of France's history, okay? And it's really until recently that scholars, especially in the United States, have taken an interest in the Haitian Revolution and have acknowledged its significance. So as you can see from this image, it was also incredibly violent. Um, you have the Haitians here attacking French soldiers. You have this decapitated head um, as a symbol of victory. Um, and it was quite, quite brutal. 
So let's go into the significance of this. So you have Haiti, which is located in the Caribbean here. Um, it became a French colony in the 17th century. It was formerly known as Saint-Domingue um, and it was very valuable to France, mainly for its natural resources. So you had sugar and coffee, which were the main natural resources. Um, and that meant that it made France a lot of money, okay? Uh, but when you're dealing with natural resources, you need people to harvest those resources. So by the 19th century, 90% of the population are slaves in Haiti, okay? And they're living under extremely brutal conditions. And if you're interested, just send me an email and send you guys some book recs about Haiti and the revolution. But it was incredibly brutal and violent. However, with the advent of the French Revolution, this population of slaves got the idea of revolting on their own. They thought, okay, wait a second, we have all of this manpower, we can take on the French. And actually, it was incredibly successful. They beat the French, it was a huge L for France, okay, it was a global embarrassment for France. And in 1804, Haiti becomes uh, free from French rule, they become an independent nation. They end up changing their name from Saint-Domingue back to Haiti, which was the original name. Um, but unfortunately for Haiti, there were really horrific uh, economic consequences. So France, um, because of this massive embarrassment, decided that Haiti needed to pay them uh, an independence debt. And so nowadays it would be equivalent to 550 million, which if you can imagine for that time, is quite a significant sum of money, okay? So basically France said, we're gonna make sure that you have no connection to any other global power unless you pay us this amount of money. And, you know, even today they're still paying it off. It basically ravaged Haiti's economy and, you know, has caused incredibly long-term problems. And it's a debt that France has not forgiven, okay? So that's also an important key element. So Haiti is not the only colony to kind of undergo this process of independence with France, okay? It was the first one, but as you can see from this map, you see France in red and you can see the colonial influence uh, throughout history, throughout these different waves of uh, colonial invasion. But what I like about the Haitian Revolution is it provides a really good launching point for discussing French identity. So when we think about French identity, does it include all of these other um, Francophone populations or descendants uh, of former colonies? Afro-French, Haitians, French of Middle Eastern descent. If you've ever been to France, you know it's incredibly diverse. Um, but however, when we think of France, we don't necessarily think of these populations. They're not necessarily represented in visual media or depictions of France. And so I wanna ask the question, why might this recognition be important? Um, especially when we think of social integration. So why isn't this integrated into the stereotypical images we see of France? These people are French, okay? Um, but there's this lack of diversity, lack of inclusion. So how might diversity factor into this community? And we can think of it not just in terms of nations, but also into micro communities as well. So in France, national identity is a really um, particular topic. For them, this identity comes before all other factors, including race, okay? So there's no official data conducted on race in France. And very recently, they removed the word race from the French constitution. So there is this sort of ostrich head in the sand approach um, to these other elements of identity that are significant. Um, but just because you ignore race doesn't mean there's not systematic racism and exclusion, okay? So this idea of liberté, égalité, fraternité, although nice in theory, it doesn't really exist in practice. Today, we have many historians, especially in the United States, and one um, who came, uh, she gave a talk last fall for one of my classes, uh, is Dr. Robin Mitchell. So she's a historian here um, at CSU Channel Islands. And uh, she wrote a book on uh, black women and French identity very recently. And one quote she says in that book is Frenchness is changing all the time, but what does not change is that black is not French, okay? And we could even say that about, um, uh, 
French people of Middle Eastern descent as well. There's sort of this separation from concepts of French identity and populations of certain religions and races. So for her, she says, race and racism are built into what it means to be French. And this comes from an ignorance of the past, of slavery, of colonialism, of all of these um, violences committed. Um, in turn, that translates into an inability to accept the present situation. So reparations need to be made moving forward. So where do we go from here? Um, like I said, this is sort of a case study. Uh, you know, we can think about our own problems in the United States or other, you know, cultural contexts, national contexts, etc. Um, but uh, moving forward, we need to engage in collective acknowledgement and responsibility for the past. We also need to engage in a critiquing of the historical narrative, okay, and also critique the representations of marginalized groups, okay, so who is producing these representations, who is producing these narratives, and really analyze that. Um, there needs to be a focus on creating communities uh, and um, Oh, I can't read my own slides. Uh, oops, sorry. Communities and I can't read, there's like a bar through that. But anyway, founded in inclusivity, sorry. And then we wanna, oh, national, concepts of national identity, thanks. F founded in inclusivity and expansions of notions of national identity. So when we think about our own national identity, we wanna think about who is excluded, um, how that might affect certain people. And, you know, for example, in the US, sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, just speak American, you know, and that is so interesting because it's like we're a country founded on many, many different cultures and also American is not a language. But, you know, so this idea that um, when we're presented with a certain image, it only includes certain factors, but also certain populations and excludes others. So finally, to conclude, um, you guys are in a really exciting time in your life, okay? You basically get a clean slate to explore new identities and to meet new people with different backgrounds, experience, and, and beliefs. And so I want you to think about how um, encounters create new identities, create new cultures, create new societies, even micro societies. Um, so yeah, and think about how, you know, when we look outwards, inevitably we're kind of having to do this analysis within. We have to go within um, and engage in this comparative approach. And with critical thinking, um, part of it includes not just your own sociocultural context, but looking across cultures and societies. So I will end there. Thank you all. Oops. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Very interesting. Who, who do we have next? It's me. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Tom Reifer. And by the way, if uh, I'd love to see you, if you wouldn't mind turning on your uh, turning on your videos, but it's up to you. But it's uh, more engaging for me to see everybody there. Um, so again, my name is uh, Dr. Thomas Ehrlich Reifer, and I teach in the sociology department. And the formal title of my talk is Hunger Only for a World of Truth, which is actually part of a song by Tracy Chapman. Um, Birthright lotteries, unequal citizenship, and struggles for democratic communities. But what I always like to do is kind of relate to the brilliant talks that I've just heard and really to think about some reflections I have about these questions that might be helpful to you as you start your undergraduate career here at the University of San Diego. So on the one hand, part of the motivation for my talk was that in the context of the formal class, speaking truth to power, citizenship and community, being necessarily a contrarian, I always think about people who are deprived of citizenship rights. Um, what Celia Ben Habib called the rights of others aliens, residents, citizens, refugees, um, uh, people who are displaced, now totaling about 100 million, but of, but of course, um, increasing all the time. And what I was struck with um, from Brittany, and it's strange that I never, I mean, I, I've thought about it, but I, didn't, I never thought about it as much as I did um, until I heard her talk, which was the relationship 
of this to Dante and specifically what you can call an exilic identity. Dante is in exile. Um, and of course, that immediately raises questions about belonging. Um, and today it raises questions about the nation, or of course, in the time of the Italian city states, it raises questions about the city. And of course, there's also the images of hell and the long question about how does it all end in fire or ice? And actually, two of the things that are the greatest challenges confronting humanity today, among them, are the threat of uh, thermonuclear war and the threat of climate change. Um, we hear a fair amount more about climate change than we do about thermonuclear war, but it all raises the question of the singular humanity, but also this question of heaven and this question of hell. Now, I come at this from a particular point of view uh, because I was born in Spanish Harlem and raised behind the Orange Curtain, Orange County, California, a tale too complex to go in here, into here. But um, because of my own struggles for belonging and with education, I got involved with an organization called the Freedom Writers Foundation. Some of you may be familiar with the um, film, The Freedom Writers with Hilary Swank. Um, that was about a group of high school students in the aftermath of the LA riots uprising decades ago, uh, who came together to challenge racism and struggle for education. Um, and of course the name Freedom Writers, W-R-I-T-E-R-F, takes up from the legacy of the Freedom Writers, R-I-D-E-R-S, and the Freedom Writers were a group of young people, mostly students, black and white, who came together to confront racism and segregation in interstate transportation in the United States. Um, the Freedom Writers kind of picked up that baton and eventually wrote a book inspired by Anne Frank and others called The Freedom Writers Diary. And most recently, um, the original Freedom Writers have gotten together with 50 plus students from around the world uh, in a collaboration that I was involved in. And we wrote a book called Dear Freedom Writer, um, Stories of Hardship and Hope from the Next Generation. And all these stories raise questions about belonging and inclusion and exclusion. So we think about citizenship, oftentimes people think about it in terms of rights, but of course you can also think about citizenship in terms of rights and obligations and in terms of questions of exclusion and exclusion. And of course, this allows us to think about the question of the common good and who's included and who's excluded. So if we look at the world today and we look at this question of rights and the rights of individuals, uh, we have this belief, or at least some of us have, that every human being by virtue of their being human and for some of us, other types of animals and sentient beings have rights and ought to have rights. But of course, one of the major problems in the world today is that the organizations that enforce those rights or take them away are states. And states enforce rights through laws of citizenship, but laws of citizenship are simultaneously laws that include and laws that exclude. So for example, when we read the story about Patsy Takamoto Mink, who helped to usher in Title IX, in the reading that I asked you to do, one of the things it says is um, that being of Japanese descent coming to Hawaii after US colonization, they were subject to, quote, racialized naturalization laws that designated them forever foreigners, foreigners aliens, aliens ineligible for citizenship. In other words, these are people living with an exilic identity. They're in exile, permanent exile. And in the United States um, today, this has to do with what we call birthright citizenship, which is related to the birthright lottery. But where did we get birthright citizenship? Until the US Civil War, there was no national definition of citizenship. And the way we got it in the context of the Civil War is has to do with two radically different versions 
of the United States of America, two radically different belief systems rooted in different ways in different assessments of the American dream. One notion of the American dream that everybody ought to be able to be free without fetters to rise to the best of their capabilities. And the other American dream that the United States is a country for white people. In the Civil War, the Confederacy in 1861 split from the United States, split from the Union and developed its own constitution. And the constitution was singularly dedicated to ensuring that there would be the enslavement of African-Americans forever. So it was dedicated to the proposition that all men and women are not created equal. And at the very beginning, Lincoln announces that the fight is a fight for the Union. And W.E.B. Du Bois, the famous African-American sociologist in his Black Reconstruction, which was recently printed, reprinted by the Library of America in 2021, tells us why. Because most Americans at the time, with the exception of African-Americans and abolitionists, wouldn't have fought to end slavery. But as the war came on, Lincoln realized something that he in some ways had predicted before when he said the nation cannot exist half slave and half free. A moment came when Lincoln realized that unless he were to exercise the level, the lever on the slave power and formulate the Emancipation Procl Proclamation in a context where hundreds of thousands of African-Americans were already fleeing on the ground floor to go to the Union, that there was no way that the war could be won. And so he announces the Emancipation Proclamation. And on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation is implemented. It doesn't end slavery, but it begins a war in which there is a closer approximation than at any other time previously in American history between the African freedom struggle and the United States of America's quest for freedom. And 200,000 African Americans become incorporated into the armed forces formally and hundreds of thousands of others had co come to Union lines. Now today, if we look at the United States, we see hundreds and thousands of statues commemorating the Confederacy. We don't see the same number commemorating those people who were born into or who lived in exilic identity because they were denied rights of citizenship. And in fact, in the context of the Civil War, the battle was not so much over slavery, but it was about whether the Confederacy was going to be allowed to expand slavery, which it wanted to do. And the North said, no, we won't let it expand. And in this context, Lincoln and the Union in the United States called upon a group of people who'd been abused and disparaged for hundreds of years. And now they called on these very people to create a new birth of freedom. And those two very different narratives of identity, one produced in a kind of exile, which is a strange kind of exile because for some it was an exile into a place in which they'd been born, but denied any rights because their labor was wanted but they weren't wanted for the unique individuals they were. They couldn't be recognized as persons, as human beings. You see some of these same themes in contemporary science fiction, uh, specifically Octavia Butler's book, Fledgling. It's a wonderful novel about a black vampire, but she wrote some earlier novels called The Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents. She's one of the first black feminist science fiction writers um, and she said she announced to her mother that she was going to become a science fiction writer when she hadn't read a single word by a black person. And she succeeded marvelously. There's now she got a MacArthur Genius Award grant. And in the recent uh, US landing in Mars, they now have the Octavia E. Butler landing site. And again, it's that particular image of this exilic identity struggling to be free, struggling to plant 
new seeds. The interesting thing is that I mentioned before that I work with the Freedom Riders and I mentioned uh, the earlier Freedom Riders. Uh, but actually there's a book called Freedom Readers, which is about the African-American reception of Dante's Divine Comedy. And part of what this is about and what my talk is about is that at the university for hundreds of years, things have been divided into what's called the humanities and the sciences. This is what C.P. Snow called the two cultures. The humanities and the arts are seen as those elements of knowledge that where you can get at the question of the good and the question of the beautiful. But the question of the truth has been reserved for science. And this is actually a splitting, as my mentor, Emanuel Wallerstein, very famous sociologist and former president of the American Sociolo of the International Sociological Association mentioned. This is a splitting of the old age search for the good, the true, and the beautiful. It's a kind of colonization or disruption of our knowledge. And it's very much tied into our inclusions and exclusions. So for example, uh, Dr. Smith was talking about France and the French Revolution and who we remember and who we don't remember. And I was very struck by the 75th anniversary of the um, ending of the Pacific War after the Japanese, and you can date the Pacific War in different ways, but um, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, December 7th uh, being called the day that will live in infamy and which actually incidentally is also Noam Chomsky's birthday and my niece's birthday. So it has a special <laughs> remembrance for me. But they had a whole huge thing in the New York Times about the 75th anniversary of the ending of the Pacific War. And what I realized is that there was nothing in this, this account about Vietnam. Vietnam declared its independence for the second time on September 2nd, 1945. Now, the US war with Vietnam was the most destructive war after the Second World War. Millions of people killed, 58,000 Americans. And yet, as Gore Vidal says, in the United States of Amnesia, we don't remember anything that happened before Monday, we don't have any recognition of this year, which is considered the most important year in Vietnamese history, when they overthrew French colonialism, and then the French recolonized them, attempted to recolonize them, and failed. And then the United States came into that same role. Now, <clears throat> the theme of this class is speaking truth to power. Um, so let me make a final connection here and then turn it over to our next speaker. This question of speaking truth to power is a little bit of an ambiguous one because those people who are in power don't necessarily care and they don't necessarily not know what's going on. Um, but one of the things that Celia Benhabib neglects in her rights of others is how many people are on the move because specifically of wars, including wars of aggression. Wars of aggression are wars where one country invades another country um, that hasn't attacked it, like Russia just did, though in the context of this expansion of the NATO military alliance, which many people predicted would lead to disaster. And another example is the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Well, I happened on a strange occasion to be at the Central Intelligence Agency in 2004, where I met the person, Paul Piller, who'd been asked to write the white paper justifying why the US had to invade Iraq. And basically he wrote a white paper which said that the intelligence community had unanimity of belief that there were weapons of mass destruction, which he knew was false. And he said it was the worst thing he ever done, he'd ever done, he'd ever done, and he wished he wouldn't have done it. He said it was policy advocacy, but of course that's not really the point because if he wouldn't have done it, somebody else would have done it. But what I remember is my friend, Dan Ellsberg, who was a former Pentagon and State Department official, who
who released the top secret Pentagon papers to protest the Vietnam War. He had been to Vietnam and he'd spent many years there uh, with the State Department. But later on, he was talking to the then person who had head, headed the Senate Foreign Relations Committee during the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Gulf of Tonkin resolution was basically a resolution that was passed in 1964, which was a pretty much a blank check for the US and Vietnam. Based on an incident on August 4th, 1964, that was my friend's first day in the Pentagon, an incident, a supposed attack on US destroyers that never happened. And this Senator told my friend that if he had released the information that he had had in his safe on that day, that the Gulf of Tonkin resolution never would have gotten out of Congress and the Vietnam War never would have happened. Well, whether that's true or not, we don't know. But later my friend had gone to a conference of the War Resisters League, and he was listening to a young, young American who was talking about all the people who were going to war, going to jail to resist the draft, to resist being conscripted and fighting in an unjust war. And he was thinking, because he had gone to Harvard too, wow, this person is really good. I'm glad there's foreigners in the audience who are hearing the best of what we have. And then Randy Keeler said, most of the office is cleared out now because everybody's in jail. And I'm happy that I'm going to be able to join them next week. And my friend went into the bathroom. And in the context of the discussion about cannibalism, I was reminded by the fact he said, we're eating our young. That the best thing a young person can do today is to go to jail. And today, we're eating our young in a different way by not dealing with the question of climate catastrophe, which is ongoing, by not dealing with the question of endemic war and the money and resources that are spent on war rather than for human life. And so though some people are privileged and other people are less so, we all have a kind of exilic identity to the present and to the future. But through study and through struggle, we can change that. We can make things better. We can create alternative communities and we can create a better world for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reifer. Well, this must mean that we have Dr. Kurt right next. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. But first, I just wanna say, you know, what, what a humbling thing it is to come at the end of um, those talks. I mean, I'm always reminded of what a privilege it is to be at USD when I get to hear Andy and Eliza and Brittany and Tom speak. And I'll try to keep this snappy and keep your attention as we go. But um, I teach in the Department of Art, Architecture and Art History, and I'm, I'm an art historian by training. And I think that's something um, different from uh, being interested in art to appreciate it. And so I, I started with this image, which was produced in 1936 by a photographer named Andre Cartes, who was living in Paris at the time, um, because it could be read as a, as a beautiful image. You know, it's balanced and it's uh, very clear and I think it's pleasing to the eye, but I think interpreting it in those terms misses one of the key facts of an image like this and what I like to communicate with my students when I get a chance to teach bright people like you. Um, that message, which maybe Eliza can read, but not everybody else can read, Defense de Fiche, basically means no tagging, right? No, no graffiti here. And in 1936, when the Treaty of Versailles is being destroyed and Germany is weaponizing Europe, uh, the idea that people would not take a stand about politics was on Kertesz's mind as he produces this object. And in a way, he is um, speaking truth to power about the feebleness of a response to um, increasing war in Europe. But I'm not gonna talk about Kertesz after that, actually. I'm gonna um, sweep into a different moment and it's gonna remind some of you of things that Eliza was saying, I have just three goals for this presentation. And one is to just ask a general question, which I won't answer fully, 
know, what's the relationship between art and truth telling? We've, we've just heard a bunch of presentations. They've all used images and we've sort of relied on them to tell us the truth about certain things that were being asserted. But I guess I wanna um, ask you all to be critical thinkers and understand that images can mean many things. In fact, uh, the print that I'm showing you on the right was relabeled multiple times. As if you do the reading for this week, you'll see reference to that. And, and I wanna move to a case study uh, as Eliza did using France as an example and the great artist, great revolutionary artist, Jacques-Louis David as an example of how we can see how images were made to mean multiple things. And then I just wanna quickly conclude with some of the claims that I've heard my colleagues made that, you know, it's a good moment for us to be thinking about these things and art can develop change beyond looking beautiful on a wall. Art can make a difference in the world and I'd like us to think about the ways in which artists have uh, tried to change things for the better. So I'll start with this claim about truth and for many people truth is equal um, to realism. And maybe this idea goes back to antiquity when Pliny remarks about how a great painter, Zeuxis, painted some grapes that were so realistic that birds tried to eat them, right? And that the truth value of that fresco was seen in the fact that it fooled the birds, it tricked their eyes. And, and this is a, a trope that returns throughout art history. I'm showing you a Renaissance painting on the right where a bird is eating painted grapes as well. And just to show you the currency of that idea that realism might be an equivalent to truth uh, is something that maybe even we hold on to today. I think it goes forward into the Baroque period. And here I'm showing um, Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio. We know him as Caravaggio's great painting, uh, The Incredulity of Thomas. So for Thomas, if you know, if you've read the Bible, uh, Thomas encounters Christ after his resurrection um, and people are surprised to see him. Thomas needs to prove to himself that it's really Christ. So here Caravaggio shows him inserting his finger. He's not just inserting his finger, he's probing that wound with the kind of physicality that's disturbing, right? And so realism for Caravaggio is almost a revolting confrontation with the truth. Um, and I would say that that continues into the 19th century, showing you a painting by Gustav Caillebot. This, uh, if you've been lucky enough to go to the Art Institute of Chicago, you've seen it on the walls of that museum. It's Paris Street, rainy day, and like his fellow impressionists, Kayabod is interested in recording the atmosphere on a particular day in Paris, the social relationships that govern the Hausmanized boulevards. All those things are part of his rendering of a kind of truth, which I think stood for a long time, at least into the 20th century, when artists like Jean Mamin uh, realized that objectivity and truth is a kind of um, furtive thing, that it, it's malleable and it changes. And so I'm showing you more people with umbrellas in Mamin's uh, comedy in the Kurfürstendamm. So she's an artist, she's Swiss born, but she's working in Berlin in the Weimar Republic. And it's, it's not clear what the comedy is in the Kurfürstendamm here. Is it the people on the streets who are in their own ways comic? Or is it what's going on inside of the theater that Mamin is uh, subject to a kind of um, examination. And it's worth noting that Maman was part of this group called the Neue Sacklichkeit, which was roughly translates to the new objectivity, as if in the 20th century, objectivity was so compromised and so changed that an artist might, you know, deviate from that strip, strict optical realism to give us other versions of reality that we might hold up as challenges to, um, to the truth. I wanna go now back and give you the quickest history of 18th century French art that you're ever gonna receive. So I'm sorry for that. And I'm sorry, Eliza, in advance for doing something that I know you must be upset uh, about hearing. But I wanna start with this work which was produced at the beginning of the 18th century by a really important academic French painter. His name was Hyacinthe uh, Rigaud. Uh, and it's, less important for being by him than who it is. And this is a portrait of Louis XIV, the Sun King. Uh, 
uh, and it was shown at the Salon in 1701. And it's, it's a big painting. And it's important for you guys to know that when it was in a room, people treated it as if it was the king. You could not turn your back on this painting. That would be uh, an insult to the King of France to do that. So you might curtsy when you stepped into the room and saw this painting. When it was shown, people understood that this was an important image, even though it looks to some of our eyes today slightly ridiculous. He's wearing tights and high heels and uh, ermine um, cape and all these things. At the time, it was meant to be a perfect representation of Louis XIV's power. And it was shown at the Salon on a big platform covered with green velvet and draped with curtains. So in case you didn't know when you stepped into the room that this thing was important, you were told by all the sign systems available to the French Academy about the role that it would play. Um, I think it became an object of of humor for later French artists. So very quickly, artists like Watteau would show an image uh, which in its own sly way, because it was a dangerous thing, as Eliza indicated, to make fun of the king. Um, you could represent this young man who's called l'indifférent. Uh, he doesn't give a shit, right? He's, he's somebody who cares not at all about the world. L'indifférent is mocking the king by his posture, by his sort of grandiose gestures. And um, Watteau wants us to understand that something is happening in the way that figures are represented in art that communicates back to the power relationships uh, that he was implicated in. He was, as a Rococo painter, obliged to satisfy the same aristocratic paintings that uh, patrons that Rigaud had, but he's also catering to different needs within that fast changing 18th century French public. Uh, and the space in which a lot of these debates were sort of sorted out was the Salon itself. So the Salon was a space within the Louvre, the Salon Carré, where every year the best French artists sent their works and they were put on display. And where your painting was put on display was a kind of direct reflection of how you were esteemed within the academy at the time. So to be skied up in the upper corners of the room was a kind of slight to the artists. And those that were hung on the line or most visible and could be discussed most directly by the public that attended these events were judged to be uh, significant in some ways. And so this is an interesting image to me because it shows a bunch of people like us standing around talking about art as if it was a very serious thing. And it was in this time period. Uh, and one of the paintings that's on the wall of this particular image, I just wanna call it out for you, um, is the painting on the left. You can see it sort of center in the room in the Salon Carré. It's by Jacques-Louis David, this artist who I wanna talk about at some length in this conversation. It's called The Oath of the Horatii or the Orati. Uh, it was done in 1784 and put on display in 1785. And on the right, I'm showing you the man who painted it. It's a big painting, as you can judge from the engraving. It occupied a big piece of that Salon Carré real estate, and it was uh, meant to communicate a message. So what's that message? It's actually a message that David, uh, who was a history painter, goes back to look at the uh, drama of Cormier, uh, a tragedy called the Horaces, and it tells this story of these three brothers, the Orati, who are, in this image anyway, taking a pledge to fight to the death against their sworn enemies. And you see them pledging to their father, we're not coming back until we've conquered, just to complicate it, uh, the people they're going to uh, fight are the Kurati, and the Kurati are engaged to the Orati's sisters. So nobody's a winner in this, right? When the, when the Kurati and the Orati get together to fight, it's gonna be a bloodbath and nobody is going to be untouched. And that's the message of David's painting is that something bad is coming in France and who is going to win, it's unclear. And people stood in front of this painting and debated its meaning. Is David saying, that the French people should pledge to fight to overthrow the monarchy and understand that that will be painful and cause uh, tremendous civil unrest? Or is he saying it's the duty of the French people to uh, be loyal to their father, which is another interpretation you could give this work. So the truth 
of David's painting is ambiguous, but people debated it nonetheless. And David, this was not his last painting. Uh, he goes on, and I'm just showing you some details, and the hands in David's painting are always really important, you know, the, the loyalty of brothers, the commitment, the sorrow, all of that is articulated in this elaborate pantomime, which the neoclassical painter completely controls and uh, was one of the reasons why he was so admired. Uh, this is another painting done shortly after, actually in the year of the French Revolution. It's got this tremendous, long, cumbersome title, but I'll give it to you anyway. It's the lictors returning to Brutus the bodies of his dead sons. And what you see here is this uh, official who learns that his children have been part of a plot to overthrow the Republic. He sentences them to death and they're being carried back into his home because after all, he is still their father. Um, and his family is reacting with predictable horror to this situation, right? They're seeing the bodies being carried in. Brutus, who's in a kind of shadowy corner, is just coming to awareness with the fact that he's put his sons to death and uh, the realities of the strife of a political conflict literally come home to roost in a painting like this one. So David was not a neutral observer of the French Revolution. And as Eliza has already told you, that bloody conflict culminated not just in the overthrowing of the king, but in the beheading of the king, right? So this was uh, the fate of the monarchy was not just to be deposed, but to be uh, obliterated, or at least the effort was to obliterate them. And we know that David participated fully in this. He was there, and I'm showing you on the left, the drawing he made of Marie Antoinette on the day that she was executed. So he's in the crowd, he's supporting this revolutionary furor, and he's a witness to it. And in some ways, these are maybe more truthful images than the ones he does for the Salon. On the left, I'm just showing you how a British cartoonist, James Gilray, responded to the French Revolution by showing the murdered or the guillotined King of France and the blood of the murdered crying for vengeance. So this was uh, imagery that was circulated throughout the world and that these artists uh, played a big role in uh, determining public opinion about uh, these fateful events. Uh, David was himself, as I said, and a revolutionary figure. He was deeply involved in the um, movement to overthrow the monarchy, even though he had painted works that were praised by the monarch before him. Uh, he's there on the day that uh, Marat, one of these Jacobin revolutionary journalists, is murdered in his bathtub. Marat had this horrible skin condition, which meant that he spent most of his days writing in a bathtub because he was so covered with sores. And in the drawing that I'm showing on the right, which was the source for the print I showed you at the beginning, David draws <coughs> Marat on his deathbed. And when he shows Marat as a revolutionary martyr, he shows him like Christ. For, for David, Marat is a Christ-like figure, almost rising from his tomb, as many artists for hundreds of years had represented Christ before. Uh, for the revolutionary artist, David, Marat and the revolutionists were a kind of new Christ-like figures that needed to be valorized. And, and in case you had any doubts about this, look at the way with all this realism uh, to the scene that uh, David puts in this painting, he inscribes the work Amaha, to Marat, um, by David in year two of the revolution. Uh, the French developed a new calendar. Now you could say that David is something of an opportunist because very shortly after the terror and the revolution sort of unwinds, he becomes uh, closely allied with Napoleon, who, as you heard, first asserted himself as uh, consul to the French state and then later declared himself emperor of France. And, and David is there to valorize him. Uh, in fact, you can't quite see him, but David is actually at Napoleon's coronation. It's an event where Napoleon crowns himself emperor, and in, in David's uh, rendering of the scene, he's giving Josephine a crown too. Uh, but then he also propagandizes for 
Napoleon. So think back on that image I showed you by Rigaud of Louis XIV. Uh, this is a very different kind of French leader. He's not so full of pomp and arrogance. Uh, he's working late. If you look at the clock in the background, he's up late at night doing the duty of the French people. Um, and, and David was fully on board with Napoleon's transition to um, chief executive of the French state. Um, so there's part of me that wants to just put out there that David was not consistent in his uh, revolutionary fur and, uh, and chose to ally himself conveniently with shifting power bases within France. But his students were remarkable. I, I think that David's uh, impact on 19th century French art can't be denied, especially um, in the work of his students. So I'm showing you this work by uh, Theodore Géricault. It's a huge painting. If you go to the Louvre, it's overwhelming. And it, it reflects a contemporary event, uh, this shipwreck off the Côte d'Ivoire in Africa, which implicated a French shipping uh, naval vessel in the uh, transatlantic slave trade long after France had made slave trade illegal. And in the story that was well reported in the newspapers in France at the time, the Medusa wrecked at sea and the survivors lashed together this raft and survived uh, for a long period of time at sea, probably by cannibalism, just to go back to some of the themes that Brittany brought back early. And, and what Jericho shows us is the moment at which this completely despondent group of survivors uh, see a ship on the horizon and are signaling with the French flag for their rescue. So it's, it's the moment in which all these contradictions come together. And it's not an accident that Jericho organizes this whole composition. So it's pointed not towards us, but towards something that uh, sort of denies our presence as spectators, even as it theatricalizes um, this historic event. And so it, it offers a different kind of truth than what David would have done even 20 years before. I wanna say that this mode of speaking truth to power in France in the 19th century doesn't end with David and it continues into uh, some of the things that Eliza gestured toward the restoration of the monarchy um, and in this work by Daumier, which shows Louis Philippe, the, the restored King of France uh, as this giant pear, which I don't have time to explain it, but calling somebody a pear was another way of calling them an ass. And so here's this giant ass, the King of France, sitting on a chamber pot. So he's sitting on a toilet, taking in everything that the French people can give him in the way of product and, and labor and excreting out of the bottom these bills, these edicts, these laws and taxes. So Daumier goes to jail for producing this work of art. He's imprisoned and censored for making this work. But I would say that the origins of this kind of protest run through French culture from the revolutionary period, actually going way back to Watteau until this moment and, and demonstrate the ways in which artists can cannily point out the truth, not without risk, but also with the goal of uh, changing the present. I, I, want to circle back, even though I said I wouldn't, to the <coughs> work by Kertesz, which I showed at the beginning, which said no posters, right? No, no graffiti, no posters. In May 1968, when the French students rose up in rebellion uh, and dissatisfaction with the state, the first thing they did was develop this really sophisticated postering mechanism so that they could cover all those places in Paris that said no posters with their own radical claims for change. And I think it was a seizing of that space, a political seizing of that space and understanding all that it would mean to seize it that motivated them to do this. So, so when I was in France, just, um, well, this is back in 2016 or 2017, I was struck by the creativity of the French poster artists and, and also their um, determination to um, communicate to a different audience. So it's, it's not an accident, it seems to me, that when the French are postering in 2016, the year of the American election, they're uh, addressing their speech, not in French, but in English, right? So she says, wake the fuck up and uh, 
you know, Donald Trump is uh, shown as a loser in this poster, which you would have found right around the corner from one of those still existing uh, signs that says, um, you know, no posters, right? So this is, I think, uh, the ways in which artists can seize space, speak truth to power, and offer us alternative visions of how we should be living in the world. I, I'm just going to end, I hope, with one more um, encouragement since you're all going to be arriving on campus soon. I hope you'll take advantage of the galleries on campus and especially a program that I think relates to some of the issues that I've tried to raise and this whole panel has tried to raise. We'll have a really extraordinary opportunity to look at the work of Latoya Ruby Frazier, who is an artist who has consistently spoken truth to power uh, in this work that she's done, which has been about the water crisis in Flint. So Frazier is an artist who's gone, lived in Flint, in Flint, Michigan, and who has made her practice really for the last seven or eight years, documenting and trying to bring change to a really untenable um, situation, it's sort of unthinkable in an American city in the 21st century that people wouldn't have access to clean water. And so this is work that I think, even though we're not in Flint, it's worth uh, spending time to look at. And I hope you'll take advantage of it when you come to campus. Can't wait to see you there. That's it. Wow, thanks to all of our panelists. What a fascinating set of lectures. And I, you know, last week, we talked about how uh, important it is to try to understand ideas from a variety of perspectives. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing this course is to try to bring together um, experts um, from all different fields who, who can shed light on our, our, our central question of, of how can we speak truth to power in different ways. And I think we've seen a, a really wonderful um, example of that today and, and direct referencing between the lectures, even though they were coming from very different perspectives from different disciplines and speaking about different topics, they were referencing each other. And that's, I think, an important um, way to think about your education at USD is every class you take, even if these classes are sometimes seemingly not related at all, can help you understand um, a new perspective, a new way of thinking about your other classes. So these classes are, you know, even though we're often not coordinating the way we've coordinated this, this course, when you're taking um, your full course load, hopefully you'll be able to take lessons from each class and apply them to your other classes. That may be more challenging when they're quite disparate classes. It may be hard to do that um, between um, some, harder to do that between some of your classes than others. But hopefully by the end of your University of edu Education, you'll look back and you'll think I have um, a broad base of understanding, a variety of perspectives and tools uh, that I can use to understand the world. And looking back, I see how uh, my courses really did speak to each other um, and did help me to understand the world in a, in a more um, complex way. So we have plenty of time for a, a nice discussion now. So I, I would really love to, to um, have some good questions, uh, whether they're clarifying questions or um, you would just like to sort of raise a new question or, or add a comment or thought. Um, so I'll open the, the floor to anyone now. Um, please just uh, throw a hand up. Um, you feel free to, to jot something into the chat if, if you're not able to, to speak up directly. I would certainly love that. But I want to point out that um, I mentioned this in the chat. Uh, Dr. Reifer mentioned Octavia Butler. One of our panelists will talk, be talking specifically about Butler in an upcoming presentation. So we're going to continue to see this dialogue back and forth. Um, so I would invite invite somebody to, to be brave and to, to offer our first question of the day or comment. Uh, yeah, um, I don't really know, like, or I guess I'm not really understanding exactly what the question was, but um, it kind of just stuck out to me with um, Miss Brittany's pr um, presentation on like Dante. Is that, is, is that his name? Okay. And kind of like the yes. idea of cannibalism and like how that gets turned into sin and how we can apply it to like nowadays, especially in our in our social society and our culture. And I thought that was just really interesting. So that's one of the things that I took away from today. 
Thank you for that. Um, and, you know, I, I really can't take credit for the way that Dante speaks to our hearts. Uh, I'm, I'm honored that I get to, uh, you know, be that vehicle. And he's not the only one by any means, you know, I mean, I think, I think just um, literature, the arts, um, you know, has, has that power, but I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear that he spoke to you and that, um, you know, that you felt something at, at his words. That's, that's amazing. 700, 700 years that separate us and, and, a, you know, a huge ocean and, you know, it's it's just amazing to me, not to mention, you know, language barriers. So um, how cool is that? Good for you. That's wonderful. Eula, yes. Um, I was trying to figure out a way to word this properly, but go, also going back to Dante, um, I know I know in uh, the presentation, somebody mentioned that the way that his interpretation of how neutral people um, go are like, reserved for like the hottest parts of hell and how that was misinterpreted so then what would he consider neutral people like where would he consider neutral people to go in the afterlife yeah that's a great question um so it is it's a paradox that's why it is confusing right because dante thinks very very lowly of neutrality um and as I mentioned, he thinks so lowly of it that he doesn't even give them a place in hell. Um, so he puts them in what's called the vestibule, but it's like a lobby, like a waiting room of hell. Um, and this is before limbo, by the way, that he um, actually treats the people in limbo uh, in kind of a positive light, um, uh, which I, I can I, I could get into it during our discussion. We can talk more about that if you'd like, but. Um, so the neutrals don't even get to be in limbo, which is technically a part of hell. They're just kind of floating. It's like, and and think about what I talked about, you know, contrapasso, kind of this manifestation of the, the inner problems coming out externally and visibly. So as these people didn't choose sides in their life, heaven and hell are not going to accept them. They're going to be not choosing sides, being forced not to choose sides in the afterlife. Um, they don't even get a home. Um, but it's interesting, I think, also that everyone uh, in hell and, and everyone in the lobby of hell, so to speak, um, is just stuck in this mindset. And so they're repeating eternally what they've done in life, um, which is not listening to one another. And that's where you get all this shrieking. And the irony is that they're all together forever and they they will not recognize that. Um, so thank you for that that comment and, and that question. Uh, and uh, it makes us think a lot about, you know, what Dante is feeling by putting them in this very strange liminal space that is, by the way, his invention. You know, Christian dogma at the time does not ha have that space. He, Dante created it. You know, it's interesting. There's a lot of uh, research on why uh, it's so hard to take serious action on climate change. And one of the reasons given is the perception of neutrality, that most people don't talk about it. They don't say much and so everybody believes that nobody cares you know that there are the really young ho people who are activists and you know that there are the deniers but it seems like most people are in this neutral middle where they're just not worried about it but that turns out to not be true so a lot of survey data suggests that lots of people are worried about it but they are so convinced that they're alone or in the minority and that it would be unpleasant or rude to bring it up that they just keep quiet. And so it's not even that they're technically neutral, but they're, they they give off the sense that they're neutral to everyone else, that, that, that they don't care, that it doesn't matter to them. And so it's a real challenge because it, the same surveys say, do you care, are you worried? And it turns out lots of people have a fair amount of anxiety and that's growing as we see these heat waves and fires and so on. Um, but then in the same survey, if they ask, do you think your neighbors care? Do you think your family members care? Even people you know well, your friends, they say, no, I don't think so. Uh, so it's it's a real troubling thing. And, and I think that might be why, why Dante sees neutrality is it's, it's so much worse to not care, not talk about something sometimes than to even be on you know, the, the, the ends of the spectrum, caring deeply about it or totally dismissing it, that, that middle is very, very damning in, in, some, in some cases. Excellent, excellent. There was a, a question I saw in the chat from, um, um, who was it? Somebody asked specifically about Ugamino from Alyssa. So I don't know if you want to address that while we're talking about this. 
Dr. Asara. Oh, yes, sorry, I'm just finding it. Yes, thank you for that question. So um, Ugolino um, is in the, not the hottest place in hell like we saw, but in the bottom of hell. So the first examples I gave you were just to address where the neutrals actually are, um, which is in this lobby that certain, we saw, you know, political figures mostly uh, said, you know, the neutrals are in the hottest place in hell and instead they're, they're, at, they're not in hell. Um, and so then we looked at Ugolino who actually is at the bottom of hell and he's at the bottom of hell for um, political treachery. But I mean, I asked my students, if you have to choose between having your head eaten and eating someone else's head, um, you know, it, it's, um, you know, Ugolino's political treachery. And then, you know, Ruggeri, who is the person that betrayed Ugolino, I mean, I don't know what kind of choice that even is. They're both bad, basically. <laughs> and I will say, and I, I don't want to take up too much time. I want to, you know, give the, the give the floor to you. But um, when fi when you know, this isn't the end of the story in hell, right? Dante will meet Satan at the very end. It's completely anticlimactic. Satan's like not even scary. Um, and Dante does that on purpose, right? He does. He wants to take power away from him. So really, what we're seeing with Ugolino is the most disturbing thing in the entire uh, Divine Comedy. Wonderful. Um... Harris, you have, you have a question. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just, I had a question for Ms. Azaro as well. Um, what do you think Dante would think about people who seem to be neutral, um, but go on questioning? As somebody who, I'm, I'm really interested in philosophy, um, and it's becoming more and more apparent that a lot of life does not have um, black and white answers, but is more in the middle, um, you know, based on experience. So what do you think Dante would say about that? Thank you for your question. And I'll, I will say that in the philosophy department, I know, I think I'm allowed to say this, that there's a Dante course being taught because I think it's on the books already. So be on the lookout for that. Um, my colleague in philosophy, Professor um, Nevitt. Um, and what I will say just very briefly is that I think Dante does um, firmly believe that there is a, a, a right way and a wrong way. And in fact, he begins a comedy saying, um, in el mezzo del camin de nostra vita, mi vi trovai una selva oscura, la dritta via era smarita, the right way was lost. And I always tell my students, but that means he thinks there's one right way for him. Right. So I would say that the power then goes back to you, right, as readers, as students, finding the nuances in Dante's worldview that that he himself did not see. Right. He sees these, you know, black and white were the terms you said. That, so these kind of um, straightforward answers to life's questions. But then you as readers with your background, your experiences and your perspectives um, through also your education, as well as your experiences are bringing um, those subtleties into the interpretation. Um, so I guess, I mean, without sounding too cheesy, you know, keep reading, <laughs> keep investigating. Um, and, and for the next four years, you know, you're going to have some really good guides to help you do that. Thank You'll you. do plenty of reading. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> not to worry. <laughs> Kyle, yes. Um, I thought it was really cool that like at the end of Dante's book, he kind of like left a lot of stuff up to interpretation and like kind of like left a lot of like questions unanswered. So like kind of to like avoid neutrality among readers. I kind of like let them think on their own and like not just like stick with the pack or stick in between, kind of like create their own ideas. Yeah, thank you. He definitely leaves it up to the reader and he ends saying that uh, words fail him. He cannot describe his experience. Um, so he does give that back to the reader, absolutely. Jacob, yes. This has been said a few times and I also said it in the chat myself as well. Uh, but yeah, the, the point he's making, it's not something that's uh, usually thought about, at least not in modern day, because usually uh, we're all thinking about uh, the supposed wrongs that we see someone else doing. But we don't usually think about uh, how, how harmful just being neutral uh, and not doing anything can be too. His, and yeah, it's a really good point when, uh, when people are just not doing anything, not contributing and not doing anything to help or uh, to help this or, or even affect the situation at all, it's just as bad, if not worse. So that's a really good point that he makes. Since we're quoting old music, I will, I'll put Rush out there. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. 
Uh, there is, it's absolutely true. Neutrality is, it's only a, only there, there's something false about that sense. Like you're not taking sides. Uh, oftentimes by not doing anything at all, you have taken side. You've uh, allowed the, the, the powers that be to continue on and you've decided against change, right? So, you know, if we need to do something like uh, react to injustices or react to climate change, it requires action. Simply doing nothing is making a choice to continue on with the status quo. Katerina, yes. Um, I have a question for Professor Azaro. Um, my understanding on Dante's perspective regarding neutral individuals based on your presentation was that he considered neutrality a greater sin than something like violence. And I was wondering if you had any opinion on the matter as to why he thought that was worse than violence. Yeah, thank you. It's really hard to say um, because like I said, the, um, the neutrals are kind of special in his hierarchy. Dante gives us almost all the answers to what he thinks is worse um, as far as sins go, except for the neutrals because they're outside of that system, right? They're outside of that, that funnel, uh, that hierarchy of sins. And so the violence, uh, the violent, there's actually three kinds, he categorizes everything, are quite far, far down. Um, they are above the uh, treacherous. Um, so they're, you know, it's not as bad as Ugolino. Um, but I, I think that he purposely leaves us trying to figure out what to do with the neutrals. And maybe Dante himself doesn't even know what to do with them if we think of his life. I mean, what is worse? The, as I said, those who, um, when he was, you know, being exiled, uh, you know, pulled the trigger, to, so to speak, or I should say, you know, wrote the edict. Um, or those who were in the room and said nothing. Um, and we have to remember that Dante is living the consequences of this in, in his life as he's writing. Um, so your, your question is a wonderful one. And I think it's something that Dante does not purposely give us answers about. We're left wrestling with it. Well, it seems like Dante does does speak to us 700 plus years later. Lots of people are moved by that. And I'd love to try to, to connect this to some of the other ideas too, because I think a lot of these ideas uh, connect very well to to our other topics of conversation. So um, let's let's practice making those connections across uh, across disciplines and topics here. Ela, yes. Um, I, I kind of was already going to shift to like the idea of French nationalism and I guess patriotism in the way where people only identify themselves as French. I was just debating on which way to look at it of like, is it like French nationalism, like everybody's the same, we're all French, doesn't matter. Or what is it like a way to diminish heritage of people of color and just saying like, you're French now, like what happened to you in the past isn't you anymore. Like, I don't know, just, I guess, wanting to hear your opinion on that. That's a really good question. So I think part of the issue with this is that in this sort of like blanket statement of liberty, equality, brotherhood, that's the idea, right? Like everyone is French, no matter what this, this sort of blanket statement. However, in reality, you have, because of decolonialization, it started with Haiti and then all these other countries who fought for independence. You also have later on these huge influxes of um, uh, immigration, right? But nowadays you have French people born in France who, uh, you know, have descendants from Africa. They're not, you know, they weren't born in Africa. They weren't born in Haiti necessarily, or like a, um, a Middle Eastern, uh, French region, but they are of a different race. You know, they're not that Eurocentric, um, what they call Francais de Souche, which is a really pejorative um, uh, expression. And it basically means like French from the root. Okay. So you have to think like with us, with the United States, we were sort of founded on this melting pot of different people. Whereas with Europe, it's a totally different story. Um, so this massive change that happened in a very short period of time um, has led to a lot of social problems, okay? So you might be judged by the color of your skin, even if you are French, you might be asked by authorities to show your papers on the street. And it's happened to American colleagues of mine who are black, um, where a French policeman will approach them and ask for papers, but then they realize they're American and it's a totally different tone of the conversation. So it's incredibly complex. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there, you know, just like here in the United States. 
but I think the idea, you know, in the French mentality is, oh, we're all French, there's no problems here. Whereas in the reality of things, um, they're ignoring certain aspects of their own history and own violence and also other aspects of people's identities that are very important. Um, just one more example before I, I pass to another question is um, religion in France. So recently they banned all religious garb or religious identifiers in France. Um, and that's mainly a way to prevent Muslims from practicing in France, okay? To sort of democratize everybody. However, it doesn't really pertain to Christians, okay? So if you wear a cross in school, you're not gonna be kicked out of school. Whereas if you wear a hijab or something like that, it's gonna be problematic. So there are these disparities, even though they'd like to say there isn't. But that's a great question, thank you. Part of the related issue that comes up is this notion very problematic that equality is the eradication of difference. So even the melting pot analogy, which is very, as Adorno, uh, Theodore Adorno, the critical theorist philosopher talks about, it's kind of an industrial capitalist analogy. You know, we're all gonna boil in the melting pot. Although Toni Morrison in her, in the new film on her said, you know, well, we were the pot, you know. Um, but actually Adorno in his Minimum Moralia a set of reflections talks about universality in the reconciliation of differences and the right to be different without fear. So one of the things you see in the world today, which is very similar to the rise of fascism after World War I, is this homogenizing nationalism. We all have to be the same and we have to eradicate this notion of difference. This is very much a theme that comes up in Octavia Butler's 2005 book, Fledgling. Um, and I don't want to give the plot away because it's it's too good, but it has to it has to do with this notion that we are different. We're not them. And um, in fact, in a for a long time in the United States, there's been this notion that uh, things are going to turn because of what they call um, demography is destiny. And people don't seem to remember that if you look at uh, Eastern Europe before World War II, very uh, multicultural societies. By the end of the war, to a large extent, they weren't because people had been murdered systematically. So this idea that things are all going to get better because we're different, it really, um, it's this, this very problematic notion that doesn't deal concretely with how can we recognize uh, the diversity and uniqueness of every individual person and not to have this, have this fixation on the sameness, that we're all the same. Sure, we're all human, right? But uh, there's nothing, there's nothing great about everybody being the same as everybody else. But contemporary nationalism really focuses on that as somehow the solution to our problem. Absolutely, and I, I see uh, Rosemary's comment in the, in the chat too, connecting this idea of neutrality to, to throughout these talks, the, the, the idea that you know, when justice calls us to, to step up, of course, we're, we're, um, we're giving up safety, but if we, there's nothing safe about doing, about kind of standing aside either, because that means that you're sort of just allowing, uh, you know, whatever the status quo is to continue. So I, I absolutely agree. These are all connected. And I think there is this, there is a connection between the, the sort of eradication of difference uh, there as well, because part, I think one of the goals of eradication of difference is to, to kind of get rid of dissent, right? To sort of appeal to, to everyone sort of being, uh, joining the side of the powerful. Um, it does, it does sort of cut out a lot of opportunity for, for healthy dissent. Um, Mahina, yes. And did I pronounce that right? Yeah, it's Mahina. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, this kind of is going back to Dr. Smith's presentation about like different identities in France. Um, I guess I could kind of apply that to where I'm from because I'm from Hawaii and a lot of people nickname it as the melting pot because there's either Hawaiians here, Filipino, Chinese, there's a bunch of nationalities in one small island. And technically we weren't even supposed to be part of the US until we got overthrown. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to say is that a lot of people who are Hawaiian and are actually from Hawaii, we are always kind of told like Hawaiians need to stick together, right? But then at the same time, we're kind of hypocrites because you're not really Hawaiian if you don't speak Olelo Hawaii, or you're not really Hawaiian if you don't eat poi, or you're not really Hawaiian if you don't know the history behind Hawaii. 
So it's kind of weird because at the same time, we're really like proud to be Hawaiian. But at the same time, we're like, oh, but are you really Hawaiian? So it's kind of like confusing because a lot of the time you can feel a stranger in your own community. But I guess what we're kind of like trying to build on is restoring that community and still like trying to teach people like what community is all about. So it's kind of confusing, but it's definitely something. So well, we could we could certainly connect this to the history of Haiti too. Uh, colonialism creates complex identities. And since part of that history is based on violence, it's it is hard to say, let's create a community when we know that this 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 the society is built on inequalities. It's built on that that colonial history, uh, so it, it creates complex identities, and it, it it's sometimes hard to overcome that history of violence and colonialism. Yeah, for sure. And Hawaii is clearly all about um, a colonial history and waves of immigration and a complex society. Absolutely. Just quickly, I put I put something in the chat about a very interesting article the New York Times had in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii had a very strong interracial working class movement in the 1930s, developed a very strong trade union movement. Although if you look at the New York Times article, see, once again, you see the limits of diversity because it talks about how diverse Hawaii is and it doesn't say anything about anti-Black racism. So a lot of times you'll find that even in the context of very strong support for diversity, there's one group that's kind of left out of it and that's something we have to overcome. Uh, Toni Morrison's Paradise is really about that in a kind of reverse, interesting way, which takes on American history. All right, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to get to as many questions as we can. Devin, please go ahead. Hi, um, this is a question for uh, Mr. Cartwright. Uh, you said something um, when you were talking about the pose of the painting mocking the Louis the Fourteenth portrait, um, and you said something about like how is a statement of um, uh, or power or some sort of realism. And I really, I really liked it, but then I immediately forgot what you said. <laughs> Would you be able to um, repeat it so I can quote you exactly in my notes? Sure, I'll try. Um, I, thank you for tracking that. I think what I wanted to say was, it, you know, the French Academy, which was this very powerful body, it trained all these artists, sent them to Italy where they could study and come back and be even better artists controlled to a large extent the success of these, and they were at the time mostly young men's careers, although in, in time, French Academy opened itself up to women. Um, so that painting by Rigaud would have been known by younger artists. They would have held it up as a model to emulate. And Watteau comes along and he's like, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure I'm into this whole ancien regime power thing. And I'm gonna make not a big painting, I'm gonna make a little painting which relies on that, but I'm gonna treat that person totally differently. So l'indifférent, even the name of it, is somebody who doesn't care, um, as opposed to somebody around whom the world revolved, right? The king was the most important political figure, according to Rigaud, that could exist. And, and Watteau totally turns that on its head, but he, he needs you and me to understand that he's relying on the same model in order to, subvert that world, he wants to say, I can take the pose and all the glory of the Sun King and turn it into something that's frivolous, which for a lot of people, Rococo art was the elevation of frivolity uh, to its highest level. So that's the point I tried to make, and I'm not sure I've made it any clearer for you. Uh, Alina, yes, please go ahead. Hello, so uh, going back to Professor Smith's lecture on nationalism, um, as a Middle Eastern myself, I see friends and family that are like from Palestine and Lebanon um, heavily identifying with like a French national identity, which also circles back to the melting pot analogy and um, how problematic it is and how like a better analogy, uh, like Isla, I, I think her name is Isla Zala said in the chat, a better analogy is like a fruit salad where like there's different ideologies being essential to having a diverse national identity and creating like micro communities. Yeah, I think that kind of goes back to the problems of social integration. Um, and, you know, you see that in, I can't speak to other 
uh, nations, but in France in particular, the lack of job mobility, for example, um, or the kind of gatekeeping that happens um, in certain professions. Uh, France is, um, as you know, Dr. Carre just said, it's founded on this elitism. You know, so they want you know the you know old white men to stay and continue the traditions. Even now, with the Académie Française, um, there still isn't a ton of diversity. Um, and different institutions like the um, the Pantheon where they, uh, um, the big tomb where they they put the, the greats of France, they just interned Josephine Baker, the first black woman. But what's interesting about that is she was American, she wasn't French. So it, the fruit salad analogy is, is more appropriate, I think, I agree, that there is this sort of like division and separation. There isn't this true integration and that's what we ultimately want to work towards by changing these narratives and um, the representations moving forward. So thank you for that comment. We started a couple of minutes late, so I'm happy to take the final two questions. Olivia, I know you you had your hand up. Did you was your question answered, or were you pulling it down in in the interest of time? I was just pulling it down in the interest of time, but I stay, stay on for a couple more minutes, just because I'd love I, to see these last two questions. Yeah, I have a question for Professor Smith too. Um, why? So in school, we talked about the French Revolution, and I learned about that. I did not know about Haiti and what went on with the Haitian revolt, the slave revolt. Why do you think we don't pay as much attention to that and don't learn about that as much as we do compared to the French Revolution? That's a really great question. Um, so I will say even for me, when I did my master's and PhD in French literature, never once, never touched it, never, uh, none of my professors ever mentioned the Haitian Revolution. So it's something that is really, really recent. Um, in the last five to seven years, people have been writing a lot about. And I think part of it is sort of the colonial imbalance that still exists today, even though you know we have decolonization, that dynamic is still there. Um, I know, I can't remember which African country it was, but it was a former colony of France and France wanted to test at the beginning of COVID its vaccines there. And I remember <laughs> the prime minister, whoever was in power made a statement and I'll try to find it online. Um, and you know, if you want to see it, you can just email me, but basically said like, no, this is just a continuation of the colonial mentality. So I think, you know, it's partly propaganda and um, it's the ignorance we've had of certain histories and certain peoples and a focus on other ones, but it is a very complex issue. Maybe someone else, maybe Tom wants to speak on this a little bit too. So I just uh, finished a co-authored book called The American Dream and Dreams Deferred, a dialectical fairy tale. And uh, one of the people we cite is a guy by the name of David Frisbee, who uh, studies the philosopher, French philosopher, actually not French, sorry, uh, German Jewish, but he spent a lot of time in France, Walter Benjamin, who talked about the need for a dialectical theory of forgetting. So part of the meta narrative of European universalism and democracy is predicated on the erasure through anti black racism of other histories. So it would complicate the story of the French Revolution and the Declaration of Rights of Man to know that Saint Domingue was a French colony. In fact, Simon Schaman, his book called Citizen, never even mentions uh, Haiti. Um, for, for former slaves from Haiti went to the French National Assembly and got the, uh, the National Assembly to outlaw slavery and make those people in the former colony citizens. Now they did this partly because they were battling the British and they were battling the Spanish. But that's a tale in which not only um, is Saint Domingue Haiti there, but in which they're actors and they have, they have their own historical agency. So for a long time, we had a kind of narrative of, in a, the Holocaust historian um, had a book called um, Bystanders, Perpetrators and Victims. So in the past, we've looked at kind of winners and losers, but we're far away from looking at other peoples that we've historically marginalized as agents in their own story. There is a book though, which captures it. It's called The Slaves That Defeated Napoleon. You have these people that were the wretched of the earth that defeated four empires. Pretty impressive achievement. Never been made into a Hollywood film. Same thing with the film Lincoln. 
um, as useful as it is, no black agency, even though it's in Washington, DC, which is a black town. So part of what you have is the representation of some and the kind of neglect of others, which Du Bois in Black Reconstruction called the American blind spot. Uh, and even the person who invented the American dream, the notion of it, John James Charles Adams talked about, well, we could only have this dream with one eye closed. Yeah, it would, it would complicate the nice stories that we tell ourselves that the, those who are in power tell themselves about how things came to be and we, uh, could go in we could have an entire class about that the, the narrative that we use to sort of justify the way things are i think that's a great great what place to leave things uh for today and to then a great place to pick them back up in your discussion sections this week so i know there were more questions and i'm sure there are more questions uh, that are brewing please raise those in your discussion sections i'm sure you'll have wonderful discussions thanks again to our panelists for really, really um, great lectures. And thank you all for your participation. And I'll see you next thank week. You. Take thank, care. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.